we were hunters, of course, first and foremost, still living out in outpost camps. And we were made to become fur traders to meet the global market for fur. And that was really the beginning of the shift of our way of life. And our spiritual practices, of course, were taken away. Uh, our drum dancing, our throat singing, all of those, a shamanism that was very powerful and grounding spiritual practices that we had were destroyed in those periods of time. And then, of course, we started to barter, and our change in diet occurred almost overnight, where we were having you know, flour and lard and tea and sugar and all of that. In the 1940s, there was a collapse of the fur market. And as a result of that, we were left behind. Nobody, everybody forgot about us, our own governments. Nobody was there to help us as we went through that, because we had become dependent on the fur trade. Um, and, and that started to create starvation and famine. In the 1960s, more historical traumas were coming into our world. The residential schools, where we were sent away for long periods of time during the 10 months of the year and home only for two months, of losing our language, losing our developmental years that we could have had in our communities with our families and our, and our culture that was going to be part of really who we were to become. And that really started to create the breakdown of the Inuit society, which was so strong and dignified and, and just in, ingenious in many ways because we have had to be very adaptive and, and very, very meticulous and very focused on so many things around us to be able to survive the harsh environment in which we lived. And so those kinds of addictions started to set in. What you see today is the legacy of all of these things that I'm talking about. And then, of course, now, in the 19, uh, starting in the 1990s, unchecked climate change, now starting to add to the already stressed challenges of our communities, you know, the poverty that we face due to the, the whole history and the poor health and the food insecurities, the addictions, the violence and suicides. And we're starting to realize, you know, what is it we have come from such a highly independent way of life that had such strong values and principles to now being so dependent on substances, processes, and institutions? And what is it that we need to do to address these issues? Well, we're finding that our, the answers don't lie very far from home. In fact, it is home. The answers lie in our culture. And, and we're finding that the medicine we seek to get back on our feet is our culture and the values and principles of that. So now we're finding that we've got to start to develop programs, whether it's in our schools or, uh, or in, pro in, in addiction programs of any kind that is trying to empower our people back together, is to create dependency liberating initiatives and programs to get us on, back on our feet. And so that's what, because when people have lost their friend, freedom, their sense of freedom, and have had much control and violent, violated upon their lives, then you've got to think about the freedom that we've lost and, de and develop programs that deal with freedom skills and freedom traps and how to avoid those freedom traps. What the world is seeking, I think, is indigenous wisdom. Indigenous wisdom, I think, is the medicine the world seeks in terms of understanding because we're not just victims of all of these things as indigenous people. We can be teachers of sustainability. If given that opportunity to heal and to be able to get back on our feet and to lead the campaign and the way forward on what we could be doing together as a common humanity is that way forward. How do we reimagine and re-engineer a way forward. Um, and I know that things do happen slowly because people are just starting to really understand more and want to understand. I should say there is bigger openings now happening as a result of the pandemic. I think that has really allowed us to pause and reflect on just how much we lost with even family members and, um, and our jobs and livelihoods all of that that we're losing as a result of the pandemic, as well as the recovery of the children at residential schools, has also created an opening and a softening of hearts across the country and beyond. Things will happen, but they can happen slowly, but they will happen at the speed of empathy, and they will happen at the speed of trust. 
If more people empathize and understand our issues at the indigenous front, then that will speed up that process of change and lead to better reconciliation faster. I said our future, the future of Inuit, is tied to the future, to the rest of the world, and we're now part of the global economy, part of global society. And our home is a barometer for what is happening to our entire planet. If we cannot save the frozen Arctic, can we really hope to save the forests, the rivers, the farmlands, and other regions? And a frozen Arctic allows us to continue to choose our own future, determine for ourselves how our economy and culture will develop. And a frozen Arctic also allows the same opportunity to the rest of the world instead of spending trillions of dollars simply to offset the impacts of a melting Arctic. So we know the cost of inaction. We're seeing it now very clearly and evidently in our own country with what has been happening lately. Every single person in this room is a leader in their own right and that we all can make a huge difference on what is happening and, and the awakenings that we have been trying to be given in the last two or three years with the pandemic and the recovery of the children on accepting that history and understanding it and understanding it from a place of empathy and, and building those trusting relationships so that we can move forward and create that the, the, the forum for true reconciliation. Thank you very kindly for this invitation and for all of you showing up in the numbers that you have tonight. I am very uh, moved by that. So thank you. Thank you so much.